Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of my Unreal Engine 4 tutorial series on replicating the skill system within the game RuneScape. In part 1, we built the core UI for the system. In part 2, we'll be covering the code that drives the system, including the growth logic for the skill level increases. Now, let's take a moment to paint a mental map of the plan. There is a critical philosophy that we will be following as we approach building the system. The software development principle called separation of concerns. The separation concerns principle merely outlines that objects should only care about the information that they absolutely need to care about. Now that sounds fine and dandy in concept, but how do we actually apply it here? If you remember from part 1, we made two specific UI objects, the meter and the panel. In this case, both will be doing very unique and specific things, with limited interaction between the two. Let's look at the panel first. The panel acts as the manager for the meters, organizing and laying them out on the screen. When other objects need to speak to the meters, it'll pass along the message. To avoid duplicating the same code across each and every meter, we also have the panel act as the brain of the system. For instance, when the player acquires enough experience to level up a particular skill, it'll inform the panel, who will calculate level up. If it deems a level up to be possible, it'll pass along the information to the specific meter. This way, information remains relevant only to the objects that actually matter. Now, let's jump over to the meters. The meters are simply the representation of the skills themselves. The only functionality they actually have is to update what information they represent on the UI. Now, to reiterate on my point earlier regarding on why these don't hold all the code for leveling up skills is that they don't really need to. If we have the code on the meters, and we have 20 different meters, then we have the same code instantiated 20 times. Now, that's just an overview of the why and the how of the system. Let's get to actually building it. The first thing our system needs is a structure that will help organize our data, and is a requirement to build a data table. If you're not familiar with these concepts, I've placed links in the description below to videos of mine that go over these. I highly recommend checking them out. Now, right-click in the content browser, Blueprints, and select Structure. Call this ST underscore Skill. Open it up. We will need quite a few fields in this. Rename the starting variable to Current Level and change its data type to integer. Next, create a new variable called current max level and make sure it's also an integer variable. These two variables represent the true current level before any negatives and the current level with negatives in case that's something your game wishes to support. Next, create a new variable called max level. Make sure it's also an integer. Next, create a new variable called icon and set its data type to a texture 2D object reference. Next, create a new variable called current experience and change its data type to float. Lastly, create a new variable called exp requirement and set its data type to float. With that done, we have all the data elements of a given skill. Let's create the actual data table that supports these. In the content browser, right click under miscellaneous, select data table. In the prompt, select our structure asset. Once it's created, rename it to dt underscore skills. Open it up. In here, let's add some skills we can use for this tutorial. In the row editor window, click the plus button on the far left. Once a row is created on the far right, Rename it to Mining. In its details, set Current Level to 1, Current Max Level to 1, and Max Level to 99. For Icon, select one of the Icon assets I had you prepare at the start of Part 1. Next, set Current Experience to 0, and EXP Requirement to 83. Now we have a skill ready to be codified. For the remaining icon assets I had you prepare, pause the video and take a moment to create a couple more entries for some new skills of your choosing. When you are ready, let's move on. In the content browser, open the WG Skill Meter widget. In the designer, we need to make sure that some of our elements can be edited in code. Select the icon item and verify that the is variable checkbox is enabled. Also verify that this is enabled on the max value item and the current value item. With those set, let's hop into the event graph. Right off the bat, we will need two custom variables. The first one will be called skill and will represent the row in our skills data table. For variable type, look up data table row handle and select it. 
set it to be publicly visible. Next, add another variable called skill info. This will represent the actual details specified in the row. For variable type, change it to the type representing our custom structure. So st underscore skills. Set this variable to be private. In the event graph, we'll be using the preconstruct node to load data prior to the final rendering of the UI. From the invent node, look up get data table row. Next, drag in a get reference to our skill variable. From it, look up break. This will expose the data table and the row name that will be publicly set in a little bit. Plug both the output pins into the get data table row node. Next, drag in a set reference to our skill info variable. Connect the execution pin of the get data table row node. From the out row pin, connect it to the input on our set node. From the set node, add a sequence node. Besides this, drag in a get reference to our icon widget. From it, look up set brush from texture. Connect this node to the top pin of our sequence node. Now, drag in a get reference to our skill info variable. From it, look up break. From the icon pin, connect it to the texture pin of our set brush from texture node. This will set the initial icon art for the meter. Before we can add our second element for the sequence to run, we need to create a new function. Add a new function to this script called update UI. When it's made, open it up. This function will be our one-stop shop for updating the values demonstrated on the meters. Initially, the icon will not be an option for update, but you can change that by adding the update to this function. For now, we'll just do the represented numbers. Let's start by dragging in a get reference to our skill info variable. From it, look up break. Next, drag in a get reference to our current value widget. From it, look up set text. From the current level pin of our break node, drag it directly into the in text pin of our set node, and it will create the type conversion node for us. Next, copy all of this code and paste it just next to this. Delete the current value widget reference node and instead drag in a max value widget reference node. Connect it to the target pin of the set text node. Next, on our break node, replace the current level connection with a connection to the current max level pin. Lastly, connect each of the execution pins and we have ourselves a complete update function. With all that said, let's jump back into the event graph. From the then one pin on our sequence, look up our newly created function. With that in place, we have our initialization logic for our meters. First, it will retrieve the details of the row we chose for this particular meter using our data table, then update the icon to represent the appropriate icon and then set all the numbers to reflect the starting level for that skill. With this complete, let's move on to our panel. Moving back to the content browser, open the WG skill panel widget. Before we dive into the code, let's go into the designer, select the meter organizer element, and just next to its name in the details panel, enable it as a variable. This is critical for what we're about to do. Next, we're gonna break how we normally do these videos. Normally, I walk step by step through each node and wire placement, explaining how to build and connect things. But in cases like this where it would take an egregious amount of time to do so, I have pre-constructed the necessary code. As I go through this code and explain each component, please follow along and create the code as you see it. If you run into any trouble or have any questions, please feel free to add a comment to this video. In the event graph, we'll be using the pre-construct event to solve a problem that our system creates. Because we built the UI in such a way that we can scale and grow the amount of meters that exist in it, we should really be wary about referencing a particular meter as who knows if we may remove it. Ideally, we should find a method of collecting all meters that exist on the UI regardless of how many there are and regardless of what their names are. That's what we will be doing. Before we dive into this code, let's look at a key variable at play here. In the variables list, you'll want a new variable called skill widgets. This will have its variable type changed to dictionary. 
If you are unfamiliar with the nature of dictionaries, it may be beneficial for you to take a moment to research them so you can understand how we will be using this variable. You'll also want to change its key data type to name and its value data type to wg underscore skill underscore meter object reference. In the code itself, we'll be using the preconstruct event to collect our list of references to all existing skill meters prior to the UI rendering. Using a for loop, we grab a list of all children to the meter organizer widget and add them to our skill widgets dictionary. The key that they are inserted under is the row name in the data table that is selected by that meter, and the value is a reference to the meter itself. With this code, no matter how many meters there are, we will have a reference to all of them. Eh, pretty nifty stuff. Take a moment to create this code on your end before we continue. Next up, let's dive into one of the most complicated functions of this entire system, the growth equation function. Create a new function called calculate new level up requirement. Open it up. You want to create two inputs, one called current requirement of the type float, and one called current level of the type integer. You will also want one output value of the type float called new requirement. Next, you will acquire a local variable called total of the type integer. Lastly, you will want to convert this function into a peer function. If you aren't familiar, peer functions are calculation functions that only serve the purpose to return information. They aren't meant to change the state of the game. You'll see how it is used shortly. Now with those, let's discuss the math you see here. I wanted to kick this off by admitting that I'm not the greatest mathematician. To try and rectify my shortcomings, I worked with a close friend on converting the known equation that RuneScape uses for the experience growth and its skills into some functional code. While I nearly achieved the expected results, the formula degrades in accuracy over time. My current understanding dictates that it's a type conversion issue, but it may be just that my math is incorrect. I apologize for not being able to provide the most precise equation and if any math wizards see a possible solution, I'd love to see your thoughts in the comment section below. Now, with that said, let's walk through this. The growth equation used by RuneScape can be easily accessed online and looks like this. Now, it's complex at first look, but when taken in steps, it's not that bad. This equation uses all preceding skill levels to build up to the experience requirement amount of a particular level. This is what this for loop does. Then we follow the rules of bed mass to perform the operations that eventually form the total of all skill levels up to the current level. Once we have that total, and after the loop finishes, we divide the total by 4 to get our answer. For those who at first glance shivered in fear at this, same. However, that is our calculation function. Let's move on to another important function. Create a new function called skill level up and open it up. For this function, you will only want one input called skill of the name type. In the event graph, start off by using a get reference to the skill widgets dictionary and using a find node to acquire the skill info variable from the skill meter named by the given input. Break open that structure and increment both the current level and the current max level variables by one. If you want to have functionality that can debuff skills, you can play with how the current level variables is iterated upon here. Once both are changed, use the exp requirement variable to calculate the new level up requirements using the fancy function we created earlier. Then, we can use a special method of updating a specific variable within a structure using a byref node. You can find this in the context menu by dragging from the new requirement pin and looking up set byref. This performs a direct overriding of the exp requirement variable using the requirement calculated by our function. Now, lastly, for good measure, throw in a simple debug message letting us know we leveled up. With that, our level up function is complete. All that's left is our final function, which is the entry point for any object wishing to level up a skill. We want a function that will be called whenever experience is gained in a particular skill. Create a new function called update skill and open it up. First off, you want to add two inputs to this function. The first will be a variable of the name data type called skill and will hold a skill name that matches a skill set by one of our meters. The second will be of the type float, called experience to add, and be the amount of experience gained. You will also want a local variable of the name type called target skill, that will store data for us while we perform some operations. In our code, we kick off by storing the name of the skill we're leveling up. Then, we use a name to fetch the corresponding skill meter in our skill widget's dictionary. Once found, we access its skill info structure variable and increase the amount of experience that meter has by the amount given by the input. 
After doing so, we check if this pushes over the limit for leveling. If it hasn't, we simply update the UI using the update function on the meter. Otherwise, we check if it's reached the max level. If we have, we simply report that there is no more levels to gain. Otherwise, we call our skill level up function, providing the skill that we're leveling up. Then, we update the UI to reflect the changes. That marks our last and final function. If you followed along and created each function I made, including the code from the event graph, you should have a functioning skill system. Now let's get a test case working on a demo for what we have. Let's cover a few more settings that will round off our existing widgets. Open up our panel widget. Select any one of our existing meters we added in part one. In the description panel, you should see a section for default with our skill variable editable here. Click the dropdown and try changing the data table value to our custom data table and select any one of the existing rows. You'll notice our meter magically changes to the icon as you do. This is because the pre-construct event node that we used earlier is called whenever these details change, allowing for immediate visual updates. Take a moment to change these values for the remainder of your meters. Once you do, that is all we need to do here. Next, we will be creating a test HUD widget to demo our full system. If you already have an existing HUD widget, simply use yours instead of mine. In the content browser, right click, user interface, and select widget. Call this WG HUD. Open it up. In the palette, under user created, drag in our panel widget. You should see the panel come in with your custom meters in it. Take a moment to size your panel accordingly. Once you do, that's all we need to do here. Going back to the main interface window, go to blueprint at the top and open the level blueprint. I don't normally recommend using this, but it's the easiest for testing. Inside, we want to start by adding a event begin play node. From it, look up create widget. For the class, choose our HUD widget. Right-click the return value pin and select promote to variable. Call this HUD ref. From the output pin, look up add to viewport. Next, look up E key and add the E input event. Feel free to choose another key if you prefer. Alongside this, drag in a get reference to our HUD ref variable. From it, look up our skill panel widget that we added to it. Then from that, look up the update skill function. In the skill input, put in the name of the row selected in one of our skill meters. I'm going to use mining. In the experience to add input, put a number of your choice. I'm going to use 75. With that, we can test. Go to the viewport and play. You should see our UI appear on the screen. Next, press the input key used in level blueprint. If you use the value I use, you should see nothing happen. That is because the first level threshold is 83, and I only added 75. If I press again, I get the level up message. If you keep pressing, you'll see the gaps between levels grow and grow relatively closely to the values used by RuneScape itself. And with that done, that is a wrap to our RuneScape skill system. As you can see, it took quite a lot of infrastructure to make this system scalable so that you can reach the size of RuneScape's existing skill system. Now, even then, it's incredibly difficult to achieve a complete replication due to the issues around calculating the growth equation. However, if you'd like to take your own spin on the system, try changing the equation you use in the calculation function to something of your own design. If you want to expand what sort of data these skills have, try expanding on the data table. There are quite a few ways you can go from here. And that's it. Thank you for joining me on this two-parter. If you liked this video or found it useful, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Most importantly though, leave your thoughts and ideas in the comment section below as I'd love to hear them. As always, I'll see you in the next one.